Conscience by Richard Marsh. I had been spending a few days at Brighton, and was sitting one morning on the balcony of the West Pier Pavilion, listening to the fine band of the Gordon Highlanders. The weather was beautiful, the kind one sometimes does get at Brighton. Blue skies, a warm sun, and just that touch in the soft breeze which serves as a pick-me-up. There were crowds of people. I sat on one end of a bench. In a corner within a few feet of me, a man was standing, leaning with his back against the railing. An odd-looking man, tall, slender, with something almost Mongolian in his clean-shaven, round face. I had noticed him on that particular spot each time I had been on the pier. He was well tailored, and that morning, for the first time, he wore a flower in his buttonhole. As one sometimes does when one sees an unusual-looking stranger, I wondered hazily what kind of person he might be. I did not like the look of him. Presently another man came along the balcony and paused close to him. They took no notice of each other. The newcomer looked attentively at the crowd promenading on the deck below, almost ostentatiously disregarding the other's neighborhood. All the same, the man in the corner whispered something which probably reached his ears alone, and my perception, which seemed to be a few disconnected words. Mauve dress, big black velvet hat, ostrich plume, 430 train. That was all he said. I do not suppose that anyone there, except the man who had paused, and the lazy-looking girl whose eyes had chanced for a moment to wander towards his lips, had any notion that he had spoken at all. The newcomer remained for a few moments idly watching the promenaders, then turning, without vouchsafing the other the slightest sign of recognition, strolled carelessly on. It struck me as rather an odd little scene. I was constantly being made an unintentional confidant of what were meant to be secrets, but about that brief sentence which the one had whispered to the other, there was a piquant something which struck me as amusing the more especially as I believed I had seen the lady to whom the words referred. As I came on the pier, I had been struck by her gorgeous appearance, as being a person who probably had more money than taste. Some minutes passed. The Mongolian-looking man remained perfectly quiescent in his corner. Then another man came strolling along, big and burly, in a reddish-brown suit, a green felt hat worn slightly on one side of his head. He paused on the same spot, on which the first man had brought his stroll to a close, and he paid no attention to the gentleman in the corner, who looked right away from him, even while I could see his lips framing precisely the same sentence. Mauve dress, big black velvet hat, ostrich plume, 4.30 train. The big man showed no sign that he had heard a sound. He continued to do as his predecessor had done, stared at the promenaders, then strolled carelessly on. This second episode struck me as being rather odder than the first. Why were such commonplace words uttered in so mysterious a manner? Would a third man come along? I waited to see, and waited in vain. The band played God Save the King, the people rose, but no third man had appeared. I left the Mongolian-looking gentleman still in his corner, and went to the other side of the balcony to watch the people going down the pier. I saw the gorgeous lady in the mauve dress, and big black picture hat with a fine ostrich plume, and I wondered what interest she might have for the round-faced man in the corner, and what she had to do with the 4.30 train. She was with two or three equally gorgeous ladies, and one or two wonderfully attired men. They seemed to be quite a party. The next day, I left Brighton by an early train. In the compartment, I was reading the Sussex Daily News, when a paragraph caught my eye tragic occurrence on the Brighton line. Late the night before, the body of a woman had been found lying on the ballast, as if she might have fallen out of a passing train. It described her costume. She was attired in a pale mauve dress and a big black picture hat, in which it was an ostrich feather plume. There were other details, plenty of them, but that was enough for me. When I read that, and thought of the man leaning against the railing, I rather caught my breath. Two young men who were facing each other at the other end of the compartment began to talk about the paragraph in tones which were audible to all. Do you see that about the lady in the mauve dress who was found on the line? Do you know, I shouldn't wonder a bit if it was Mrs. Farningham. That's her rig out to a T, and I know she was going up to town yesterday afternoon. 
She did go, replied the other. And I'm told that when she started, she'd had about enough cold tea. The other grinned, a grin of comprehension. If that's so, I shouldn't wonder if the poor dear opened the carriage door, thinking it was some other door, and stepped out onto the line. From all I hear, it seems that she was quite capable of doing that sort of thing when she was like that. Oh, quite. Not a doubt of it. And she was capable of some pretty queer things when she wasn't like that. I wondered. These young men might be right. Still, the more I thought, the more I wondered. I was very much occupied just then. It was because I had nearly broken down in my work that I had gone for a few days to Brighton. I doubt if I even glanced at a newspaper for some considerable time after that. I cannot say that the episode wholly faded from my memory, but I've never heard what was the sequel of the lady who was found on the line, or indeed anything more about her. I accepted an engagement with a deaf and dumb girl who was about to travel with her parents on a long journey pretty nearly round the world. I was to meet them in Paris and then go on with them to Marseille, where the real journey commenced. The night before I started, some friends gave me sort of a send-off at the Embankment Hotel. We were about halfway through the meal when a man came in and sat by himself at a small round table nearly facing me. I could not think where I had seen him before. I was puzzling my brain when a second man came across the room and strolled slowly by his table. He did not pause, nor did either allow a sign to escape him to show that they were acquaintances. Yet I distinctly saw the lips of the man who was seated at the table frame about a dozen words. White dress, star in her hair, pink roses over left breast, tonight. The stroller went carelessly on, and for a moment my heart seemed to stand still. It all came back to me. The pier, the band of the Gordon Highlanders, the man with his back against the railings, the words whispered to the two men who had paused beside him. The diner in front of me was the Mongolian-looking man. I should have recognized him at once had not evening dress wrought such a change in him. That whispered sentence made assurance doubly sure. The party with whom I was dining had themselves been struck by the appearance of a lady in the white frock with a diamond star in her hair, and the pink roses arranged so daintily in the corsage of her dress. There had been a laughing discussion about who was the nicest-looking person in the room. More than one opinion had supported the claim of the lady with the diamond star. In the middle of that dinner, I found myself all at once in a quandary, owing to that very inconvenient gift of mine. I recalled the whisper about the lady in the mauve dress, and how the very next day the body of a lady so attired had been found on the Brighton line. Was the whispered allusion to the lady in the white dress to have a similar unpleasant sequel? If there was fear of anything of the kind, what was I to do? My friends, noticing my abstraction, rallied me on my inattention. May I point out to you, observed my neighbor, that the waiter is offering you asparagus and has been doing so for about five minutes. Looking round, I found that the waiter was standing patiently at my side. I allowed him to help me. I was about to eat what he had given me when I saw someone advancing across the room whom I knew at once, in spite of the alteration which evening dress made in him. It was the big, burly man in the red-brown suit. The comedy, if it were a comedy, was repeated. The big man, not apparently acknowledging the existence of the solitary diner, passed his table, seemingly by the merest chance, in the course of his passage towards another on the other side of the room. With a morsel of food on his fork, poised midway between the plate and his mouth, the diner moved his lips to repeat his former words. White dress, star in her hair, pink roses over left breast, tonight. The big man had passed, the morsel of food had entered the diner's mouth. Nothing seemed to have happened, yet I was on the point of springing to my feet and electrifying the gaily dressed crowd by crying murder more than once afterwards i wished i had done so i do not know what would have happened if i had i have sometimes asked myself if i could say what would not have happened as a matter of fact i did nothing at all i do not say it to excuse myself nor to blame anyone but it seemed to me at the moment that to do anything was impossible because those with whom i was dining made it so i was their guest they took care to make me understand that I owed them something as my hosts. They were in the merriest mood themselves. They seemed to regard it as of the first importance that I should be merry too. 
To the best of my ability, I was outwardly as gay as the rest of them. The lady in the white dress with her party left early. I should have liked to give her some hint, some warning. I did neither. I just let her go. As she went across the room, one or two members of our party toasted her under their breath. The solitary diner took no heed of her whatever. I had been furtively watching him the whole time, and he never once glanced in her direction. So far as I saw, he was so absorbed in his meal that he scarcely raised his eyes from the table. I knew, unfortunately, that I could not have mistaken the words which I had seen his lips forming. I tried to comfort myself with the reflection that they could not have referred to the vision of feminine loveliness which had just passed from the room. The following morning I traveled by the early boat train to Dover. When the train had left the station I looked at my telegraph. I read a good deal of it. Then at the top of the column on one of the inside pages I came across the paragraph headed Mysterious Affair at the Embarkment Hotel. Not very long after midnight, in time it seemed, to reach the paper before it went to press, the body of a young woman had been found in the courtyard of the hotel. She was in her night attire. She was recognized as one of the guests who had been staying in the hotel. She had either fallen or been thrown out of her bedroom window. Something happened to my brain so that I was unconscious of the train in which I was a passenger as it sped onward. What did that paragraph mean? Could the woman who had been found in her night attire in the courtyard of the Embankment Hotel be the woman who had worn the white dress and a diamond star in her pretty brown hair? There was nothing to show that she was. There was nothing to connect that lightly clothed body with the whispered words of the solitary diner with a touch of the Mongol in his face. Yet I wondered if it were not my duty to return at once to London and tell my story. But after all, it was such a silly story, it amounted to nothing. It proved nothing. Those people were waiting for me in Paris. I could not desert them at the last moment, with all our passages booked, for what might turn out to be something even more fantastic than a will-of-the-wisp. So I went on to Paris, and with them nearly round the world, and I can say without exaggeration that more than once that curious-looking gentleman's face seemed to have gone with me. Once in an English paper which I picked up after we had landed at Hong Kong, I read about the body of a woman which had been found on the Great Western Railway line near Exeter Station, and I wondered. When I went out into the streets and saw on the faces of the people who thronged them something which recalled the solitary diner at the Embarkment Hotel, I wondered still more. More than two years elapsed. In the summer of the third I went to Buxton, as I had gone to Brighton for a rest. I was seated one morning in the public gardens, with my thoughts on the other side of the world, we had not long returned from the Sandwich Islands, and I was comparing that land of perpetual summer with the crisp freshness of the Buxton air. With my thoughts still far away, my eyes passed idly from face to face of those around me until presently I became aware that under the shade of a tree on my left a man was sitting down. When I saw his face my thoughts came back with a rush. It was the man who had been on the pier at Brighton and at the Embarkment Hotel, and who had traveled with me round the world. The consciousness of his near neighborhood gave me a nasty jar. As at the Embarkment Hotel, there was an impulsive moment when I felt like jumping onto my feet and denouncing him to the assembled crowd. He was dressed in a cool gray suit. As at Brighton, he had a flower in his buttonhole. He sat upright and impassive, glancing neither to the left nor right, as if nothing was of interest to him. Then the familiar comedy, which I believe I had rehearsed in my dreams, began again. A man came down the path from behind me, passing before I had seen his face, and under the shady tree paused for an instant to light a cigarette, and I saw the lips of the man on the chair forming words. Gray dress, lace scarf, Panama hat, 5-5 five -five train. His lips framed those nine words only, then the man with the cigarette passed on, and I really do believe that my heart stood still. Comedy? I had an uncomfortable conviction that this was a tragedy which was being played, in the midst of that light-hearted crowd, in that pleasant garden under those laughing skies. I waited for the action to continue. Not very long. In the distance I saw a big burly person threading his way among the people towards that shady tree, and I knew what was coming. He did not pause even for a single instant, 
he just went slowly by within a foot of the chair, and the thin lips shaped themselves into words. Gray dress, lace scarf, Panama hat, 5-5 five -five train. The big man sauntered on, leaving me with the most uncomfortable feeling that I had seen sentence of death pronounced on an innocent, helpless fellow creature. I did not propose to sit still this time and allow those three uncanny beings, undisturbed, to work their evil wills. As at the hotel, the question recurred to me, what was I to do? Was I to go up and denounce this creature to his face? Suppose he chose to regard me as some ill-conducted person, what evidence had I to adduce that any statements I might make were true? I decided in the first place to leave him severely alone. I had thought of another plan. Getting up from my chair, I began to walk about the gardens. As had not been the case on two previous occasions, there was no person in sight who answered to the description, gray dress, lace scarf, Panama hat. I was just about to conclude that this time the victim was not in plain view, when I saw a Panama hat in the crowd on the other side of the band. I moved quickly forward. It was certainly on a woman's head. There was a lace scarf spread out upon her shoulders, a frock of a very light shade in gray. Was this the woman whose doom had been pronounced? I went more forward still, and with an unpleasant sense of shock, recognized the wearer. I was staying at the Empire Hotel. On the previous afternoon at tea time, the lounge had been very full. I saw a tall lady, who seemed to be alone, glancing about as if looking for an empty table. As she seemed to have some difficulty in finding one, and as I had a table all to myself, I suggested as she came near that she should have a seat at mine. The manner in which she received my suggestion took me aback. I suppose there are no ruder, more ill-bred creatures in the world than some English women. Whether she thought I wished to force my company upon her and somehow scrape an acquaintance, I cannot say. She could not have treated my suggestion with more contemptuous scorn had I tried to pick her pocket. She just looked down at me as if wondering what kind of person I could be that I had dared to speak to her at all, and then, without condescending to reply, went on. I almost felt as if she had given me a slap across my face. After dinner, I saw her again in the lounge. She wore some very fine jewelry. She was a very striking woman, beautifully gowned. A diamond brooch was pinned to her bodice. As she approached, I saw it was unfastened. It fell within a foot of where I was sitting. I picked it up, and offered it to her with the usual formula. I think this is your brooch. You have just dropped it. How do you think she thanked me? She hesitated a second to take the brooch, as if she thought I might be playing her some trick. Then when she saw that it was hers, she took it and looked it over carefully, and what do you suppose she said? You are very insistent. That was all. Every word in such ineffable tones. She was apparently under the impression that I had engineered the dropping of that diamond brooch as a further step in my nefarious scheme to force on her the dishonor of my acquaintance. This was the lady who in the public gardens was wearing a light gray dress, a lace scarf, and a Panama hat. What would she say to me if I told her about the man under the shady tree and his two friends? Yet if I did not tell her, should I not feel responsible for whatever might ensue? As she went in danger of her life, I was as sure as that I was standing there. She might be a very unpleasant, a very foolish woman, yet I could not stand by and allow her quite possibly to be done to death, without at least warning her of the danger which she ran. The sooner the warning was given, the better. As she turned into a side road, I turned into another, meaning to meet her in the center of hers and warn her there and then. The meeting took place and as I had more than half expected, I entirely failed to do what I had intended. The glance she fixed on me when she saw me coming and recognized who I was conveyed sufficient information. It said, as plainly as if in so many words, that if I dared to insult her by attempting to address her, it would be at my own proper peril. Nonetheless, I did dare. I remembered the woman in the mauve dress and the woman in the white, and the feeling I had had that by the utterance of a few words I might have saved their lives. I was going to do my best to save hers, even though she tried to freeze me while I was in the act of doing so. We met. As if scenting my design, as we neared each other, she quickened her pace to stride right past. 
but I was too quick for her. I barred the way. The expression with which, as she recognized my intention, she regarded me. But I was not to be frightened into dumbness. There is something I have to say to you, which is important, of the first importance, which is essential that I should say and you should hear. I have not the least intention of forcing on you my acquaintance, but with your sanction... I got as far as that, but I got no farther. As I still continued to bar her path, she turned right round and marched in the other direction. I might have gone after her. I might have stopped her. I did move a step or two, but when I did, she spoke to me over her shoulder as she was moving. If you dare to speak to me again, I shall claim the protection of the police, so be advised. I was advised. Whether the woman suffered from some obscure form of mental disease or not, I could not say, or with what majesty she supposed herself to be hedged around, which made it the height of presumption for a mere outsider to venture to address her. That also was a mystery to me. As I had no wish to have a scene in the public gardens, and as it appeared that there would be a scene if I did more to try to help her, I let her go. I saw her leave the gardens, and when I had seen that I strolled back. There under the shady tree still sat the man with a touch of the Mongol in his face. After luncheon, which I took at the hotel, I had a surprise. There, in the hall, was my gentleman going through the front door. I spoke to the hall porter. Is that gentleman staying in the house? The porter intimated that he was. Can you tell me what his name is? The porter answered promptly, perhaps because it was such an unusual name. Mr. John Tongue. Then he added with a smile, I used to be in the Navy. When we were on the China Station, I was always meeting people with names like that. This gentleman is the first I've met since. An idea occurred to me. I felt responsible for that woman in spite of her stupidity. If anything happened to her, it would lie at my door. For my own sake, I did not propose to run the risk. I went to the post office and sent a telegram to John Tongue, Empire Hotel. The clerk on the other side of the counter seemed rather surprised as he read the words which I wished him to wire. I suppose this is all right, he questioned, as if in doubt. Perfectly all right, I replied. Please send that telegram at once. I quitted the office, leaving that telegraph clerk scanning my message as if he were still in doubt if it was in order. In the course of the afternoon, I had another idea. I wrote what follows on a sheet of paper. You threw the woman in the mauve dress onto the Brighton line. You were responsible for the death of the woman in the white dress at the Embankment Hotel. You killed the woman who was found on the Great Western Line near Exeter Station. But you were going to do no mischief to the woman in the gray dress and the lace scarf and the Panama hat who was going up to town by the 5-5. Be sure of that. Also, you may be sure that the day of reckoning is at hand when you and your two accomplices will be called to strict account. In that hour you will be shown no more mercy than you have shown. That is as certain as that, at the present moment, you are still alive. But the messengers of justice are drawing near. There was no beginning and no ending. No date, no address. I just wrote that and left it so. It was wild language in which I took a good deal for granted that I had no right to take. And it savored a good deal of melodrama and highfalutin. But then my whole scheme was a wildcat scheme. If it succeeded, it would be because of that, as it were, the very wildcat property. I put my sheet of paper into an envelope, and I wrote outside it in very large, plain letters, Mr. John Tung. Then I went into the lounge of the hotel for tea, and I waited. And I kept on waiting for quite a considerable time. It was rather early for tea, but as time passed and people began to gather together, and there were still no signs of the persons whose presence I particularly desired, I began to fidget. If none of them appeared, I should have to reconsider my plan of campaign. I was just on the point of concluding that the moment had come when I had better think of something else, when I saw Mr. John Tung standing in the doorway, and with him his two acquaintances. This was better than I had expected. Their appearance together in the public room of the hotel suggested all sorts of possibilities to my mind. I had that missive prepared. I waited until I had some notion of the quarter of the room in which they proposed to establish themselves. Then I rose from my chair, and crossing to the other side of the lounge, left on a table close to that at which they were about to sit, I hope unnoticed, the envelope 
on which Mr. John Tung was so plainly written. Then I watched for the march of events. What I had hoped would occur did happen. A waiter, bustling towards the newcomers, saw the envelope lying on a vacant table, picked it up, perceived that it was addressed to Mr. John Tung, and bore it to that gentleman. I could not hear, but I saw what was said. The waiter began, Is this your letter, sir? Mr. Tung glanced, as if surprised, at the envelope which the man was holding, then took it from between his fingers and stared at it hard. Where did you get this? he asked. It was on that table. What table? The one over there, sir. Mr. Tung looked in the direction in which the man was pointing, as if not quite certain what he meant. How came it to be there? Who put it there? Can't say, sir. I saw an envelope lying on the table as I was coming to you, and when I saw your name on it, I thought it might be yours. Tea, sir? Tea for three, and bring some buttered toast. The waiter went on. Mr. Tung remained staring at the envelope, as if there were something on its appearance which he found a little puzzling. One of his companions spoke to him, but as his back was towards me, I could not see what he said. I could guess from the owner's answer. Some rubbish, a circular, I suppose, the sort of thing one does get in hotels. Then he opened the envelope, and I had a rather a funny feeling. I was perfectly conscious that, from the point of view of the court of law, I had not the slightest right to pin a single one of those words which were on the sheet of paper inside that envelope. For all I could prove, Mr. Tung and his friends might be the most innocent of men. I might find it pretty hard to prove that the Mongolian-looking gentleman had whispered either of the brief, jerky sentences which I had seen him whisper, and even if I could get as far as that, there still remained the difficulty of showing that they bore anything like the construction which I had put upon them. If I had misjudged him, if my deductions had been wrong, then Mr. Tung, when he found what was in that envelope, would be more than justified in making a fine to-do. It was quite possible, since I could not have eyes at the back of my head, that someone had seen me leave that envelope on the table, in which case my authorship might be traced, and I should be in a pretty awkward situation. That woman in the gray dress would be shown to have had right on her side when she declined, with such a show of scorn, to allow me even to speak to her. So while Mr. Tung was tearing open the envelope and taking out the sheet of paper, I had some distinctly uncomfortable moments. Suppose I had wronged him. What was I to do? Own up? Make a clean breast of it? Or run away? I had not yet found an answer when I became perfectly certain that none was required. My chance shot had struck him like a bombshell. The change which took place in his countenance when he began to read what was written on that piece of paper was really curious. I should have said he had a visage over whose muscles he exercised great control, Mongols have as a rule. But those words of mine were so wholly unexpected that when he first saw them, his expression was, on the instant, one of stunned amazement. He glanced at the opening words, then, dropping his hands to his sides, gazed round the room as if he were wondering if there were anyone there who could have written them. Then he raised the sheet of paper again and read farther. And as he read, his breath seemed to come quicker. His eyes dilated, the color left his cheeks, his jaw dropped open. He presented a unique picture of the surprise which was born of terror. His companions looking at him were affected as he was without knowing why. The big burly man leaned toward him. I saw him mutter, You look as if you've had a stroke. What's the matter? What's that you've got there? Don't look like that. Everyone is staring at you. What's up? Mr. Tung did not reply. He looked at the speaker, then at the sheet of paper. That time I am sure he did not see what was on it. Then he crumpled the sheet of paper up in his hand, and without a word strode across the lounge into the hall beyond. His two companions looked after him in bewildered amazement. Then they went also, not quite so fast as he had done, but fast enough. And all the people in the lounge looked at each other. The manner of the exit of these three gentlemen had created a small sensation. My little experiment had succeeded altogether beyond my anticipation. It was plain that I had not misjudged this gentleman. It would be difficult to find a more striking illustration than that presented by Mr. John Tung of the awful accusing conscience which strikes terror into a man's soul. I could not afford to let my acquaintance with those three interesting gentlemen cease at this moment, 
the woman in the gray dress must still not be left to their tender mercies. After what seemed to me to be a sufficient interval, I left my tea and went after them into the hall. I was just in time. The three men were in the act of leaving the hotel. As they were moving towards the door, a page came up, an official envelope in his hand. Mr. John Tung, a telegram for you, sir. Mr. Tung took it as if it were some dangerous thing, hesitated, glanced at the men beside him, tore it open, read what was on the flimsy sheet of pink paper, and walked so quickly out of the building that his gait almost approached a run. His companions went after him as if they were giving chase. My wire had finished what those few plain words on the sheet of paper had begun. I was lingering in the hall, rather at a loss as to what was the next step that I had better take, when the woman in the gray dress came out of the lift, which had just descended. A cab was at the door on which was luggage. Although she must have seen me very clearly, she did not recognize my presence, but passed straight out to the cab. She was going up to London by the 5-5 train. I no longer hesitated what to do. I, too, quitted the hotel and got into a cab. I still wanted ten minutes to five when I reached the station. The train was standing by the platform, the gray-frocked lady was superintending the labeling of her luggage. Apparently she had no maid. She was escorted by a porter who had her luggage in charge to a first-class carriage. On the top of her luggage was the telltale thing which had probably done more harm than good, the dressing bag which is so dear to the hearts of many women, which ostentatiously proclaims the fact that it contains their jewels, probably their money, all that they are traveling with which they value most. One has only to get hold of the average traveling woman's dressing bag to become possessed of all that she has, from the practical thief's point of view, worth taking, all contained in one portable and convenient package. At the open door of the compartment, next to the one to which the porter ushered her, the big burly man was standing, rather to my surprise. I thought I had startled him more than that. Presently, who should come strolling up but his more slightly built acquaintance? Apparently he did not know him now. He passed into the compartment at whose door he was standing without a nod or a sign of greeting. My glance traveled down the platform. I saw that standing outside a compartment only a few doors off was Mr. John Tung. This did not suit me at all. I did not propose that those three gentlemen should travel with the gray frock lady by the 5-5 train to town. Rather than that, I would have called in the aid of the police though it would have been very queer a tale that I should have had to tell them. Perhaps, fortunately, I hit upon what the old-time cookery books used to call another way. I had done so well with one unexpected message that I thought I would try another. There were ten minutes before the train started, still time. I rushed to the ladies' waiting room. I begged a sheet of paper and an envelope from the attendant in charge. It was a queer sheet of paper which she gave me, and on it I scribbled, You are watched. Your intentions are known. The police are traveling by the 5-5 train to London in attendance on the lady in the gray dress. If they do not take you on the road, they will arrest you when you reach town. Then hi-ho for the gallows. I was in doubt whether or not to add that last line. I dare say if I had had a second or two to think, I should not have added it. But I had not. I just scrawled it off as fast as I could, folded the sheet of paper, slipped it into the envelope which I addressed in big bald letters to Mr. John Tung. The attendant had a little girl with her, of perhaps twelve or thirteen years old, who was acting as her assistant. I took her to the waiting room door, pointed out Mr. Tung, and told her that if she would slip that envelope into the gentleman's hand and come back to me without having told him where he got it from, I would give her a shilling. Officials were examining tickets, doors were being closed, preparations were being made to start when that long-legged young person ran off on her errand. She gave Mr. Tung the envelope as he was stepping into the carriage. He had not time even to realize that he had got it before she was off again. I saw him glance with a startled face at the envelope, open it, hurriedly scan what was within, then make a dart into the compartment by which he was standing, emerge with a bag in his hand, and hurry from the station. Conscience had been too much for him again. The big burly man, seeing him going, went hurrying after him as the train was in the very act of starting. As it moved along the platform, the face of the third man appeared at the window of his compartment, 
gazing in apparent astonishment after the other two. He might go to London by the 5-5 if he chose. I did not think it mattered if he went alone. I scanned the newspapers very carefully the next day, as there was no record of anything unusual having happened during the journey, or afterwards, I concluded that my feeling that nothing was to be feared from that solitary gentleman had been well-founded, and that the lady in the grey dress had reached her destination in comfort and safety. What became of Mr. Tung when he left the station, I do not know. I can only say he did not return to the hotel. That Buxton episode was in August. About a month afterwards, toward the close of September, I was going north. I started from Euston Station. I had secured my seat, and as there were still several minutes before the train went off, I strolled up and down the platform. Outside the open door of one of the compartments, just as he had done at Buxton Station, Mr. Tung was standing. The sight of him inspired me with a feeling of actual rage, that such a dreadful creature, as I was convinced he was, should go through life like some beast of prey, seeking for helpless victims whom it would be safe to destroy, that he should be standing there so well dressed, so well fed, so seemingly prosperous, with all the appearance about him of one with whom the world went very well. The sight of him made me positively furious. It might be impossible for various reasons, to bring his crimes home to him, but I could still be a thorn in his side, and might punish him in a fashion of my own. I had been the occasion to him of one moment in which conscience had mastered him and terror held him by the throat. I might render him a similar service a second time. I was seized with a sudden desire to give him a shock which would at least destroy his pleasure for the rest of the day. Recalling what I had done at Buxton, I went to the bookstall, and purchased for the sum of one penny, an envelope, and a sheet of paper. I took these to the waiting room, and on the sheet of paper I wrote three lines, without even a moment's consideration. You are about to be arrested. Justice is going to be done. Your time has come. Prepare for the end. I put the sheet of paper containing these words into the envelope, and waylaying a small boy, who appeared to have been delivering a parcel to someone in the station, I instructed him to hand my gentleman the envelope, and then make off. He did his part very well. Tung was standing sideways, looking down the platform, so he did not see my messenger approaching from behind. The envelope was slipped into his hand, almost before he knew it, and the boy was off. He found himself with an envelope in his hand without, I believe, clearly realizing whence it had come. My messenger was lost in the crowd before he had turned. It might have tumbled from the skies for all that he could say with certainty. For him, the recurrence of the episode of the mysterious envelope was in itself a shock. I could see that from where I stood. He stared at it, as he had done before, as if it had been a bomb which at any moment might explode. When he saw his own name written on the face of the envelope and the fashion of the writing, he looked frantically around, as if eagerly seeking for some explanation of this strange thing. I should say, for all his appearance of sleek prosperity, that his nerves were in a state of jumps. His lips twitched, he seemed to be shaking, he looked as if it would need very little to make him run. With fingers which I am sure were trembling, he opened the envelope, he took out the sheet of paper, and he read. When he had read, he seemed to be striving to keep himself from playing the cur. He looked across the platform with such an expression on his face and in his eyes. A constable was advancing towards him with another man by his side. The probability is that, scared half out of his sentence, conscious having come into its own, he misinterpreted the intention of the advancing couple. Those three lines, warning him that he was about to be arrested, that his time had come to prepare for the end, synchronized so perfectly with the appearance of the constable and his companion, who turned out to be a plain clothes man, engaged on the company's business, that in his suddenly unnerved state, he jumped to the conclusion that the warning and its fulfillment had come together, that those two officers of the law were coming to arrest him there and then. Having arrived at that conclusion, he seemed to have passed quickly to another, that he would not be taken alive. He put his hand into his jacket pocket, took out a revolver, which he had no doubt been kept there for quite another purpose, put the muzzle to his brow, and while the two men, thinking of him not at all, were still a few yards off, he blew his brains out. He was dead before they reached him, killed by conscience. They found his luggage in the compartment in which he had been about to travel. 
the contents of his various belongings supplied sufficient explanation of his tragic end. He lived in a small flat off the Marleybone Road, alone. The address was contained in his bag. When the police went there, they found a miscellaneous collection of articles which had certainly, in the original instance, never belonged to him. There were feminine belongings of all sorts and kinds. Some of them were traced to their former owners, and in each case the owner was found to have died in circumstances which had never been adequately explained. The man seemed to have been carrying on for years, with perfect impunity, a hideous traffic in robbery and murder, and the victim was always a woman. His true name was never ascertained. It was clear from certain papers which were found at his flat that he had spent several years of his youth in the East. He seemed to have been a solitary creature, a savage beast alone in its lair. Nothing was found out about his parents or his friends, nor about two acquaintances of whom I might have supplied some particulars. Personally, I never saw nor heard anything of either of them again. I went on from Euston Station by that train to the north. Just as we were about to start, a girl came bundling into my compartment, who I knew very well. That was a close shave, she said, as she took her seat. I thought I should have missed it. My taxi cab burst a tire. What's this I hear them saying about someone having committed suicide on the platform? Is it true? I believe there was something of the kind. In fact, I know there was. It has quite upset me. Poor dear, you do look out of sorts. A thing like that would upset anyone. She glanced at me with sympathetic eyes. I was talking about you only yesterday. I was saying that a person with your power of what practically amounts to reading people's thoughts ought to be able to do a great deal of good in the world. Do you think you ever do any good? The question was asked half laughingly. We were in a corridor carriage. Two women at the other end of it suddenly got up and went, apparently in search of another. I had been in no state to notice anything when I had got in. Now I realized that one of the women who had risen was the one who had worn the gray dress at Buxton. She had evidently recognized me on the instant. I saw her whisper to her companion in the corridor before they moved off. I couldn't possibly remain in the same compartment with that half-bred gypsy-looking creature. I've had experience of her before. I was the half-bred gypsy-looking creature. The experience she had had of me was when I saved her life at Buxton. That I did save her life, I am pretty sure. I said to my friend, when they had gone, I hope that sometimes I do do a little good, but even when I do, for the most part it's done by stealth, and not known to fame, and sometimes, even, it's not recognized as good at all. Is that so? replied my friend. What a very curious world it is. When I thought of what had happened on the platform, which we were leaving so rapidly behind, I agreed with her with all my heart and soul. End of Conscience